Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take, take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. The word of God to the people of God. We've been exploring in this six-week series some of the big doubts Christians have. We've looked at questions about God, about the Bible, the fate of non-Christians, and today we are going to examine the topic of heaven. So, will you pray with me? Loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Speak through me or in spite of me, but open our hearts to understand what it is you have for us to hear today. This we ask in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. <clears throat> when you think of life after death, what is it you see in your mind's eye? What is it you picture? Has it changed from when you were a kid? you see something different now? Um, maybe you see angels playing harps. I've seen lots of pictures like that over the years. Or maybe it's just white and light. Maybe you see those streets of gold that we have heard about. And then ask yourself, what do you feel? When you go to that place in your head and you picture heaven, what kind of feelings does it emote with you? Is it peace? Love, joy, happiness. And like I asked, are the images you see now the same ones you would have seen 25 years ago? Or have they changed somehow? For me, when I was very young, I can remember sitting in Sunday school and, and when the teacher would have us pray, I don't think I actually listened to the prayer, but in my head, I was in heaven. And I was picturing it. And it just looked like you know, streets and houses, but it was just this wonderfully happy place. Do we have doubts about heaven? That's, that's the question of the day. The Bible provides us several descriptions of life after death. And one of the first we find is in the Old Testament. It's actually in Genesis, chapter 5, verse 24, where we read, quote, Enoch walked with God. Then he was no more, because God took him. Genesis. Where did God take him? Well, presumably God took Enoch to heaven to be with him. And then in 2 Kings, we all remember the story where Elisha witnesses his, his teacher, Elijah, carried up to heaven. Remember that? The chariot of fire? 1 Samuel depicts the prophet Samuel, when he is raised from Sheol, remember we talked about Sheol, that's where everybody went when they died, good, bad, and different, everybody went to Sheol, and yet we read in 1 Samuel about him being raised from the realm of the dead. And then in Isaiah uh, chapter 25, there's uh, a description of a feast on a mountain of the Lord after death has been defeated. So there are several descriptors in the Old Testament. And we know there are passages in the New Testament, um, including in the Gospels. Um, Luke, in chapter 16, tells us about a man receiving rest and comfort upon his death. And of course, the passage that Dan just read for us, the familiar one. We hear this again and again. It's read very often at funerals because it provides comfort. In my Father's house are many dwelling places, rooms, mansions, whichever version you use go to prepare a place for you. So the Bible describes in many different ways heaven or what happens after we die. But what is most important to hear is the message that after death somehow we are with God. This is a good thing. It's 
not unusual to wonder, to have questions about heaven. But beyond the witness of the Bible, we can point to accounts of those who had near-death experiences as a continued existence after we die. I've told a couple, couple of you in a Bible study, but my dad told me many times a story about when he was a teenager. We lived in Newport. I don't know if you've ever heard of Lake Sebastopol, but that's where they all went swimming. That was the swimming hole. And he and a bunch of other kids were swimming in Lake Sebastopol. And apparently one of the kids with them was not a very good swimmer. My dad was a very strong swimmer. But this kid who wasn't apparently got in over his head, and I don't know if he got tired or panicky or what happened, but he went down. And my dad and I assume others, although my dad would never take credit for anything, um, but they went to this young man's aid. They got him out of the water, dragged him up, and, and somehow got the water pumped out of him. And he came to looked up at my dad and the other kids around him and he said, if that ever happens to me again, do not pull me out. Do not save me. He said, that was the most amazing, beautiful, and peaceful experience I have ever had in my life. And I honestly wish they could have saved me. Near-death experiences are not as uncommon as we might think. And there's one among us who has personally experienced an episode. So I've asked Emily if she might be willing to come and share a little bit with us. I know this, is not, I know this will not be easy for you to share, but Emily's a strong lady, and she has said she will share a little bit with us. So Emily, would you come? You have to go up there. You don't have to. <laughs> I can hear you better if you come up here, but you don't have to. You want to stand beside you? So uh, Sue asked me to talk about when I was at Mass General in 2020 with my dissection and some of the things that I experienced. So I, I'll start by saying that I understand that, that um, the beginning of my experience was truly just hallucinations. My in-laws were not in the ceiling trying to hurt me. My uncle didn't die, and there were not robots running, through the ho running me through the hospital. Uh, saying that, I know there was a shift in what I was experiencing that was undoubtedly real. I remember a pattern of events that kept repeating over and over. I was underwater, and for a lack of a better word, I was being tortured. I wasn't in any pain, but I didn't like it. This kept replaying and replaying, and it was on its third time. I remember just saying to make it stop. Do what you need to, but just let this part be done. I meant it. I was not scared. I was ready if that, that's what was going to happen. But instantly it stopped. I was not in the water anymore. I ended up in an auditorium type room with stadium seating. People were singing. I heard and saw some of my family. But I remember vividly my dad's parents, John and Wilza, and his grandmother, Juanita. In true joint fashion, he was not so quietly talking. He didn't, he was asking, he didn't know what I was doing there because I was too young and it wasn't my time. I could also hear my family on earth singing and crying and praying. I was, then I was in a hallway type space and there was a bridge. Uh, I had a task and the task was to walk across the bridge um, Jesus was on the other side of the bridge, and I was supposed to walk across the bridge and not break eye contact. The problem was is that I didn't have my glasses, so I kept trying and failing. But then he said, it's not your time, and then I started waking up. After discharge on one of my follow-ups, I went to meet my cousin Keenan and see the church he pastored at. And I met his daughter, Hadley. Keenan's wife, Ashley, gave me a tour of their church, and it was, it, so it's really big. It, it has a soccer field in it. <laughs> and when I walked into the sanctuary, I was instantly brought back to that time in the hospital at Mass General. The 
East Point Christian Church Sanctuary was an exact replica of the heaven I experienced. I had never been there. I had never seen the church. I had never seen pictures. I had no prior knowledge before that day. This just verified that I saw heaven that day in the hospital and gives me peace of mind that those who have gone before me will be waiting for me there. Thank you, Molly, for sharing that. I know it's not easy. Much research has been done. I suspect that most of us here have read books or articles about near-death experiences. Nobody can prove or disprove these stories. And we can't prove conclusively, I suppose, that heaven is real. But for many of us, these stories, Emily's, my father's, and others like it, are compelling evidence for belief in the reality of heaven and a deep trust that we will be with God when we leave this earth. And ultimately, it is the resurrection of Jesus that provides the greatest hope and reassurance of the reality of heaven. Every single one of the four Gospels, they may not have everything in agreement, but they all agree that Jesus' tomb was empty and that Jesus appeared again alive to the disciples and others on the third day after he died a gruesome death on the cross of Calvary. Yes, some of the disciples doubted. Doubt isn't new. Doubt was part of the Christian experience even then. I don't know if you remember, but before the disciples even saw Jesus, they were hiding and they were fearful. They thought they were the next to be crucified. He wasn't in the tomb. They thought he'd risen, but I'm sure maybe there was a niggling doubt there. Maybe somebody had stolen the body. You know, maybe the tomb was robbed. But then, quote, on the evening of that first day of the week when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. The disciples went from hiding fear to proclaiming the resurrection of Christ. The disciples knew unequivocally death was not the final answer. Jesus had conquered death. Jesus was. Jesus is. And not so long after that, the disciples were also present when Jesus ascended into heaven. His moment of returning to God. They shared that message throughout their lives. And those that have followed and us, we continue 2,000 years later to share that wonderful story. Our Christian faith centers on the sure and certain hope of resurrection through Jesus Christ our Lord. We will rise, and we will be with God after we leave this earth. Some of us were almost there and came back. Thank you, Emily. We appreciate you. We will be in heaven. It will be our turn at home. And although I'm not the best Willie Nelson fan, I do love the Brock Band mercy them, I can only imagine. Will you pray with me? Oh God, we are so grateful. We are so grateful that we have the sure and certain hope of resurrection to eternal life with you. We are grateful for the witness of those who have had experiences in their lives that add extra assurance to what we already know, that when we die, we will be with you. So bless us now as we continue in our worship. Keep us strong in our faith and help us to share always this message of love and resurrection to all. This we ask in the